Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Today, in our gospel lesson from Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 26, Jesus tells a parable about the farmer. And his point isn't to glorify the farmer. No, rather, his point is to describe the farmer as someone who gets to witness miracles on a regular basis. The farmer is the one who rises up each morning, goes about his work, goes to bed next evening, and all the while the seed that he has sown sprouts and grows in the field. What a miracle, what a remarkable thing the seed really is. That by itself, on its own, it germinates and grows, but, but then within that little seed contains all of the information, all that is necessary to produce a plant that can abundantly bear fruit. I mean, think of a little tomato seed. Right? Maybe some of you start your tomatoes uh, early each year. And from a little seed that is so small can come not only this great big plant, a tomato plant, but it can bear pounds and pounds and pounds of tomatoes. Jesus uses the example of a mustard seed in our text as another very small seed, and yet it grows so large that the birds of the air can come and rest on its branches and take comfort in its shade. And all this germination happens of its own accord. There's nothing we can really do to make it germinate or, or, or make the, the, those first stages of the seed grow. No, indeed, the Greek here itself, the Greek word implies automatically. The seed is sown, and automatically within itself, it begins the process of germination and sprouting. And Jesus says, so it is with the kingdom of God. God's word is that seed, and God's word is what causes the, the growth of his kingdom. God's word is what wakens hearts and minds and souls to the truth of the gospel and points people to all that God has done in Jesus Christ. We are those birds, us believers and all who will believe. We are the birds that come and find rest and comfort in the truth of the gospel. We are the ones who know that our sins are forgiven and we are right with God. Indeed, that's what it means to be a Christian. We are the ones who dare to live knowing that we are righteous before God. And not because of us, right? But because of all that Christ is and all that Christ has done. And that is remarkable. As remarkable as a seed germinating, the fact that the likes of us dare to say that we are right with God. Because think about it, when you look at the world and our lives in the world, there is so much that's not right. I mean, our eyes see it all the time. So much that's not right in, in our families, maybe. So much that's not right in our health or our finances. And just on and on in our work. And that doesn't even throw in our conscience, right? The way our conscience calls us to look inward sometimes and see so much that is not right in here. In our attitudes, in, in our motives, in our goals. But then you also add to it what God's word has to say about the matter. And God's word, though it is the seed, the kernel of the gospel, it is at the same time that which does point out all that is not right. In case our conscience or our eyes miss something, God's word is the one that points out where sin is at work in us, where there is brokenness. It causes us to reflect on the lives that we live. Are we discontent in life, right? Discontentment doesn't seem that much like a sin and yet it can lead to so much that is sinful. Are we discontent with our situation in life? Not trusting God, but deciding to seize control of life on our own terms. Are we discontent with the people that God has placed in our life? Have we been angry lately? Have we spoken in ways that have caused harm to others only because we want them to hurt like we hurt? Have we been negligent with our responsibilities? Selfish, maybe, in our work. Greedy in the way that we handle the things that God has blessed us with and in relation to others. Have you been lazy? Have you lusted? Have you taken things that aren't yours? Have you honored the Sabbath day, given God his due? Right? These are all the ways that we can start listing out sin and it doesn't take long for any of us to find ourselves on that list and find that there is so much that is not right. And yet then God's word comes like a little seed, the gospel. 
And it reminds us that there is only one simple approach to sin like that. And it is simply to repent. To repent. Because repentance means just that, to turn away from our sin and turn to Christ. To recognize that because of everything that Christ was and is as true God and true man and all that he has done, you and I can live our lives today and every day knowing that we are right with God. All may be wrong out there, but we are right with God in Christ. And it's in that knowledge that we can have peace. And brothers and sisters, that is like the little seed that our Lord refers to. A seed that really does grow and produce abundant fruit. You want to talk about something that makes a difference in a life. It's the certainty that the gospel provides, the peace and the comfort that the gospel provides that we can call ourselves right before God. Such a simple message. Such a simple truth. And yet it is the truth that has changed hearts and minds and lives for 2,000 years and continues to do the same. And because of that truth, why wouldn't we want the whole world to know? Why wouldn't we sow this seed wherever we go? I mean, think about today's Father's Day. What an important message for fathers to take to heart. To know that it is our calling in life to live out in this way, right? To be living testimonies of this seed that God has planted in us. The hope that is ours in the gospel, that because of Christ and what he has done, we are right with God. How are we living that out in our families? How are we letting Christ's forgiveness flow back and forth in our relationships to our children? Are we, are we living out the hope that is ours in such a way that we're willing to let our children see us Come to them and let them hear the words on our lips. Son, daughter, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way I handled that. The words that I spoke. How hard I was on you. Do you forgive me? To let the words of the gospel flow from their lips too. To give them that opportunity to say, Dad, I love you. I forgive you. It's okay. Are we letting them see us do the same with their mother? To give her the same opportunity for us to confess our sins and say the same to her and hear the words of forgiveness coming from her and and responding to with forgiveness. Dads, are we taking seriously the need for our children to see us in love with God's word? To see us take it seriously? Taking moments to bring them and lead them in a study of God's word? To cut off the video games and, and the TV once in a while? To take a few minutes before bedtime to gather the family and discuss what God's word means and why because they need to see you need it they need to see you turn to it dads are we taking the opportunity when our children come to us with their fears or their worries or their anxieties and the troubles in life whether they're in pre-k or high school or in college or they have kids of their own in the midst of talking it through with them taking the time to lead them in prayer over it Letting them see you pray for them. These are the kinds of seeds that bear fruit. Fruit that will produce an abundance in their life. Right? The gospel, the word of God, in that way, has the power to do such things. And it goes beyond our families. It's a responsibility we all have. To recognize the need of the world out there for the seed of the gospel. And you know, that seed is planted not just here through the pulpit and what I do on this day. It's an important part of it, yes, but it happens just as much in your lives. In the opportunities that you see, in the brokenness of your friends and co-workers and your family's lives. To let them know that despite the brokenness, there is a Savior and there is rest and comfort and peace that can be found in Christ. To lead them in prayer. It may not seem like much. It may just be a moment or two, a few sentences that you say, but it plants a seed, a seed that the Holy Spirit alone can cause to germinate and grow and produce fruit. We're called to be the ones who scatter this seed. And I know, as Lutherans, we know the Holy Spirit is the one who does the work. He's the one that makes the seed grow, but he uses us to scatter the seed. And so it is in that way that I think so often we as Christians And Lutherans maybe especially, people sometimes ask if we're interested in outreach, and our stereotypical answer is often, no, 
that's for the board of outreach or that's for someone else but how can we if we take seriously what our calling is to be sowers of the seed of the gospel say that we're not interested in outreach because outreach is what we do every time every time we share our faith every time we seize the opportunity to share our faith and you know surprisingly our church body the lcms hasn't done such a bad job of that over recent years I know we're stereotypically sometimes as Lutherans seen as people who don't do much outreach, but I was just at district convention this past week, and a part of that is hearing all the various reports from our district president, the synodical president, and so forth. And actually, in terms of outreach over the last 10 years or so, the LCMS has done quite a bit. Indeed, I was surprised to hear that 35% of our adult members have been brought into the church through evangelism and outreach. That's staggering. 35%. They weren't here, they aren't in church, in a Lutheran church because they were born that way or their parents or grandparents were Lutheran. They were brought in because someone took the opportunity to plant a seed. A seed of the gospel. To answer their questions, to encourage them in the midst of their troubles, to pray with them and to point them to Christ. In fact, the LCMS is doing a lot better than a lot of mainline denominations in this. We're all declining a little bit in this secular world, but... But actually, our rate of adult evangelism and outreach is actually outdone in the last recent years many other denominations, Southern Baptist, Methodist, Roman Catholics. And I don't say that to brag. No, rather, I think it's simply a reminder of how vital it is for the church, for God's kingdom, for us to be sowers of the seed. Because where the seed is sown, it sprouts and grows according to God's will. And so our Lord's mandate then is to take the seed to the end of the earth, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. For the love of the Lord, sow the seed. Believe. And because you believe in this gospel so much, then speak, right, wherever you go. And I know we can all shake our heads sometimes and lament at the way our world is changing in regards to the church. A world uh, and a culture that's growing so secular where so many seem to be leaving the faith and indeed many are although it's good to know at least that the number of consistent diehard if you will Christians remains the same in our country people who are in church regularly who pr practice their faith regularly and consistently that percentage has not declined most of those who are falling away are those who are nominal in their faith mostly now that they live in a world where the faith is not seen as such a good thing, the church is not seen as such a good thing, maybe it's no surprise that many are drifting away. But at the same time, I think it can be seen in an exciting way for you and me. It means more and more the church is being refined. More and more the average Christian encountered on the street is not going to be someone wishy-washy in their faith. No, rather it's going to be someone who knows the hope that is within them and is willing to plant the seed home. It's good news for those of us in love with the gospel. It's good news for a church like St. Paul. It refines our focus. And it helps us see that almost everyone we encounter out there has a need for the gospel, has a need for prayer, has a need for encouragement, has a need for Christ. Like a campfire, right? In the dark of night, right? The church becomes a beacon of hope. We can let our light shine in the darkness, as Christ said, so that by our good deeds, others may see and give glory to our God in heaven. And truthfully, it doesn't take much for God to do the work of growing his kingdom. I mean, Jesus uses the image of a seed, right? Something so insignificant. You drop it on the ground, and you'd never be able to distinguish it from the dirt. And yet from something so small, God grows amazing things. And God has always worked that way through his church. I mean, consider in the scriptures a story like Gideon. In the days of Gideon, described in the book of Judges, Israel was hiding. Literally, everyone was hiding because the Midianites had come and uh, they were so numerous that it meant total annihilation and subjugation. No stopping them. And so Gideon's hiding in a wine press, trying to thrash out a little wheat to feed his family when the angel of the Lord comes and calls him to be the one who will deliver God's people. And Gideon can't believe it. But finally, Gideon does, in faith, 
do the bidding of the Lord. And when he gives the call out to Israel to gather, 32,000 men assemble. And yet then the Lord tells him, this is too many. And he begins culling them down until there's nothing but 300 left. 300 men against a multitude. And yet, it's through those 300, through something so weak and insignificant, God, God does his great kingdom work. And God does it through us, through you. In the midst of your circumstances and your brokenness, you, you have the hope that's within you. The knowledge of knowing that you have peace with God and you are right with God. And how can we not share that with those that we know? I guarantee you, if I ask you to raise your hand, every one of us would. If I ask, who of you has a family member who does not know the Lord, who does not practice the Christian faith? So many opportunities to plant the seed. May we never be indifferent to that. You know, if I were to ask you, what's the opposite of up? We'd all say down, right? Or what's the opposite of bad? We'd say good. Well, what's the opposite of love? We'd probably want to say hate. And while hate and love are very, very different, for sure, hate and love still both imply some kind of connection to another, right? We either love them, right, and our connection to them, or we despise them and hate them. But I would say there's another word that maybe is even more opposite of love. Not just hate, but indifference. Indifference means that we could care so little about someone that they're not even on our radar. We take no notice, we have no concern, no care whatsoever, not even enough to hate them. How easily sin and our own selfishness can lead us to indifference toward the world. We can become so focused on ourselves that we lose sight of what God gives us the opportunity to do by simply speaking to the hope that is within us and planting the seed home. And we never be indifferent to this calling as God's people. Isaiah 55 promises us that the word of God is like a rain shower. It goes out across the earth and it waters the earth and causes what? Seeds to sprout. It never returns empty. God has called us, all of us, to be sowers of the seed. May God empower you with that love and desire to do just that. Because he will make it grow. God will always cause his kingdom to grow. In Jesus' name, amen.